Uh, guests in studio, uh, we all, as he walked into the room, we all had to stand and salute as the commander in chief has returned to his humble domain, Michael Hornby. Good morning, delegate. <laughs> Good morning, Rob, John, Matt. I was really disappointed you didn't make it into your office first because your your daughter has a doll, which is insane. A lifelike doll. Insanely. Yeah. Yes. I, I, had, I had to borrow a doll for my CPR class, my research on Tuesday night. How, how many babies do you coach in I, football? There's a lot of infants out there. <laughs> Why did you have to have the, the baby for, the, for CPR class? Um, they uh. you, When you get certified and then recertified, they certify you in adult, child, and infant CPR all okay. at once because – 80% of the energy is spent on adult CPR. Gotcha. And then after that, it's pretty simple because every, almost all the same rules apply to children and then infants. So they figure gotcha. we'll just get all three of them for you know while you're here. So you passed. And that's how they do that, yes. Okay. Uh, but I have to say, I, I don't have dolls in the house, and I don't have stuffed animals. <laughs> so... Uh, that you talk about. That I talk about. <laughs> Publicly known. My, there's my comfort doll. Yeah. Yeah. After I, if someone's mean to me on the show, I go home and hug my comfort doll. Uh, but I, so I said, I sent Kresha a text, or I, I talked to you, and I said, I need a doll. Do you have, does, does Carly have a doll I can borrow for this thing? Because they said, bring a stuffed animal or a doll. And they bring in this lifelike looking child. This yeah, I get, I, Kresha came down and said, hey, can you give this to Rob? And, and I looked at her with this blank stare, like, huh? She didn't give me the backstory. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> the backstory is key on that request. Uh, I just do as I'm told. Do you so, want to hear a distressing statistic? Well, well, hold on Go one second. Yeah, just, just, just to finish it. I, so I take it to this course, and like the coach beside me, who's a guy I coached with at Oakdale, he had like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle doll, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and the guy to the right had a big furry stuffed bear. And I tried out this lifelike infant, and the first thing everyone did was go like, Oh, my goodness, that's such a real-looking doll. <laughs> well, the instructor comes over, because there's like 80 people in the room. There's like 10 instructors, and they're trying to make sure you're doing everything properly. And when it comes time for the infant thing, I pulled the infant thing out. She comes over, and she's like kneeling down to, to, to you know, prepare the area. And she looks at this infant doll, and she couldn't stop staring at it. <laughs> I said, it's creeping you out, isn't she? She goes, yes, it is. But she, like, locked on it for 30 seconds. I said, if you keep staring at it, it's going to talk to you. It, it will move. It will move. <laughs> she got up and ran yeah, away. Carly used to take that everywhere, even on vacation. Every time we'd take it through airport security, it would get all kinds of <laughs> recognition. That we're putting it through the, the, the x-ray machine. People were like, they're putting their baby through the x-ray machine. <laughs> Yeah, she told me, she said, don't leave it in your car with the windows up. Someone will call the police yes. on you. So, <laughs> Delegate John Hardy, who's the vice chair of finance, also in the room. Good morning, John. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Mr. Gilstrap, you were about to say. I just said, during my fire department years, I did CPR hundreds of times on real people and two saves out of the hundreds of times. And both of those went down while I was with them. So the rest of them passed away? The, yes. Oh, my goodness. What? Yeah, so only, only, only two saves out of hundreds of Are you of sure you were doing it right? I, <laughs> were you I, trained, I was, I was an instructor. And we, had, we used to have, we used to have, we would train on dummies that would actually register compressions and stuff. Yeah. So Rob, was, if I have a heart attack here in the studio, I want you, <laughs> I want you to give me CPR. <laughs> that is a horrible statistic. It is. That's as bad a batting average, Matt, as anybody could have. <laughs> two, does, two for hundreds. That gives me I didn't no. kill them. They were dead when I got there. <laughs> okay. You know, so it was... <laughs> well, that was an interesting little thing to add. Yeah, show's over. Um, <laughs> close it up. Wow. Yeah, close, lock it up. Uh, hey, I want to get into the uh, fire department bill uh, that you folks addressed there first, but uh, I want to go to the jails first because in our segment to open up the show, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney uh, Joe Kinzer, who was in yesterday, gave us some great detail about the ERJ and the violence that takes place there inside the ERJ and then made uh, a special specific uh, statement of fact about the n number of guards there who he is prosecuting for taking bribes or in kind to be able to get things into the prison. And his comment at the end of our open was, they're not making a lot of money, so this is a way you supplement your income, which we obviously don't want in our prisons. We don't mm -hmm. want drugs and money being sm smuggled into the prisons, uh, clearly. You folks have taken some steps to address that and uh, in regards to increasing pay for the guards. Well, I will tell you that there has been a tremendous amount of work done in the legislature over the past three or four months by uh, not only House leadership and a few of our members uh, of, of the House who, who work in that uh, 
uh, committee, uh, Senate leadership, also from the uh, the secretary that oversees the uh, DRC, um, the governor's office. There's been a, a tremendous amount of work in that. Uh, the legislation that we just passed, uh, it, it hopefully, is a first step towards trying to remedy this. I don't think this is a one-time fix-all. I think this is probably something that we are going to continue to work with. This is not a problem that is just uh, in Berkeley County or just in West Virginia. This is a problem uh, across the country. Uh, but the legislation that we just passed uh, will put uh, quite a bit of money into the jails and prisons for deferred maintenance, which will help things. It will also put uh, quite a bit of money in for raises. Um, the corrections officers in Berkeley County and, and at our facilities, which are con considered, um, you know, critical needs or ha have critical needs, uh, are going to see about a $10,000 raise. So our CO1s, which is your entry level um, uh, corrections officers, are going to be see about an $8,000 raise. And then when you put that um, uh, the critical uh, vacancies pay in there it's going to move them to about ten thousand dollars and as you move up to like a co3 which is the top um, of a corrections officer before we, you become like a lieutenant or a, a captain or move into administration uh, you're going to receive about fifty five thousand dollars in pay some of that's based on your years of service we've also went back in and in those areas uh, we have step raises so if you are a co3 step one step two step three there's additional pay so if you do not want to become let's say you're a co3 and you enjoy working the tier and you don't want to become a lieutenant or a captain or work in administration now you have a way for those guys would top out there was no place for them to go now we have implemented step raises in for those um and that critical need uh piece that's kind of was it it's kind of a version of locality pay, so we are getting a little more money yeah. here in the Eastern Panhandle than, than some places. Yeah, it's called, so. a, criti it's called a critical vacancy pay, right. and there is facilities uh, such as our facilities that have these vacancies that will uh, let these uh, uniformed officers receive this additional pay. Uh, also, we have went in and our non-uniformed or non-uniformed employees who work in our prisons. Uh, we're go was going to receive a one-time bonus of around $2,300 in October. Uh, Delegate Mike Height uh, and the Finance Committee worked diligently uh, on that piece of legislation, and we doubled that. So we went back in and worked with House leadership, worked with Senate leadership, and the governor's office. Uh, all this was uh, really brought on by Delegate Height, and, and I really want him to be able to speak to this, and, and he was really the driving force behind that. Um, so we was able to double that. We took that from we get we're going to give them a one-time bonus of twenty-three hundred dollars in October, and then we are going to give them another twenty-three hundred dollar bonus in March. And we wanted to do that because we wanted them to understand that we we want them to stay through the next legislative session to let them know that we are serious and working on trying to take care of them also trying to find a revenue stream so where we can give them not just a one-time bonus, but we can also give them a raise like we've done for the corrections officers. So uh, with all that work being done in the jails and prisons, I think that this is a first step um, Band-Aid to this crisis. I think that this will re require continued work. I don't think this is a one-time fix. Uh, and hopefully we will be able to retain uh, our COs who are doing a good job, uh, who are not, uh, you know, working in the uh, dark side, uh, you know, with the uh, prisoners or, uh, you know, bringing contraband in. Also, uh, hopefully that our um, uh, non-uniformed employees will also understand how much that we respect them and need them and appreciate them. So, uh, so the legislature can continue its work in the upcoming January session to remedy this issue. And what is the, are you missing like a thousand CO uh, uh, prison uh, workers? Rough, like eight hundred and so, uh, change, I think. That's a lot least. of backfilling. It yes, is, it, it is a lot. And, and we're hiring those people, but we're not retaining them. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the issue. And, and this started um, a couple of months ago. A lot of us, even though we're not on these committees, have been working on. We went and visited ERJ and got an inside look at it, and we sat down with non-uniformed and uniformed officers, as well as the leadership down there. And it, 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 it's not a pretty job. It's not something that, hey, I want to go be a corrections officer. It, it, it's, it's pretty scary. You, you, you're putting your life on your line every single day. So um, it was really eye-opening. I think that's how we got so passionate about making this, this right. It'll be really interesting, kind of a social experiment. You know, two years from now, have we 
filled all these positions and proven that it really was money, or is it really that it's a, it's a really hard job that people well, have to I, I, could I be think, both? Though, yeah, and know? I think I think some of it, I think a lot of it is money, but we've also are going and changing the structure. Uh, you know, we can't just come sometimes come in and just throw money at problems. We have to find out what is the systemic issue that's going on and what is the structural issue within the agency and how we can fix that. And I think that we do that by looking at retirement packages, uh, maybe shortening the period of time uh, in retirement. Uh, these people work in a very stressful environment. So like we do for our firefighters and our police departments, maybe changing the structure of that a bit. We've also changed how we're going to train um, instead of just hiring these uh, men and women and sending them to training for six weeks and then bringing them back and then they kind of understand they don't really have a stomach for it we're going to let them work you know in the prison system in the jail system for a couple weeks and make sure that they really want to do this we're also working um, Mike Height has been working very hard on a reciprocity yeah. so making sure that we have a reciprocity if we have a corrections officer that's let's say we have a corrections officer that's maybe retired from Virginia maybe they have a 20 year retirement over there someone's worked over there for 20 years and they're still relatively young and in good shape and they want to continue to work. They can bring their training that they received in Maryland or Virginia and come over. And yeah, work we weren't us. accepting the training before, and it was just a matter of letting them know from within the jails. That's kind of what we got was, hey, we everybody else accepts our training. Why don't we accept theirs? Yeah, I had an in, in depth conversation with a director from DCR, and and um, and and. Uh, so and he was very open to a lot of our ideas and understood that he, you know, had a crisis and they want to work through it and they want to fix it. So I, I feel but, like but that that line of thinking applies to West Virginia for a lot of the licenses you get for beautician and everything else down the line. You can be licensed and in so many other states, and West Virginia won't accept it. We we, we had that come at, that conversation rulemaking review yesterday where um, all the agencies are coming in and, and reviewing their rules and we're going over licensing and how much they charge for fees. It's an amazing process. It's one of the best committees I've, 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 I'm so proud to be on because I'm learning so much. But just that, Rob, it, there's so many little laws that we, we are doing that. Why? Mm -hmm. Why don't we accept And that? we've been working continually to reform yeah. those. There's yeah. been a major reforms at the state level to try to, get a, try to get the state of West Virginia in line with some of the other states and accepting their, you know, their licensures for, you know, this, you know, if you're cutting hair in Maryland or Pennsylvania and you've been doing that for 20 years. And you've got 5,000 hours of training right, already in it. Yeah. Right. There's no reason that the state of West Virginia should require you to be relicensed. My wife has cut my hair for almost 30 years and she's never been licensed yet. I'm probably getting her in Wait. trouble by saying that, right? So. <laughs> You, get arrested. you look great, uh, yeah, man. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Has there been any type of a questionnaire given to corrections officers when you look at some of the issues of, of trying to be able to retain or even those that have, you know, been trained and then turned around and walked away? Is there like an exit interview, so to speak, to go, why, why are you not staying in it? Are you learning from the people in the field? Most definitely. There has been a lot of input from corrections and, and from their administration, and their administration has done their homework mm -hmm. and understood you know their problem and why they are having trouble with boots on the ground. So they, it's very key for them to be involved in this um, and and letting us know what we need to do to make them better. Um, you know, so like I said, you just can't always stand back as a legislature and just allocate money towards problems. Mm -hmm. We have to work uh, as a team. And and I feel like that, you know, uh, Delegate David Kelly has been our representative from the House, and um, Delegate Kelly is a retired. Um, police officer. He spent most of his life um, as a police officer. He was a county commissioner for a while. He has a huge background in service, and he is very passionate about this. And uh, he has really led the way uh, uh, on the House side of this. And uh, he has really been down in the weeds trying to figure out, you know, why we are having this problem, and many other states are having this problem. Do we see critical vacancy pay coming the way of teachers? <laughs> In uh, the future sessions? I, I if we had our way, we, we'd <laughs> add that to every position, wouldn't yeah. we? Yeah. Oh, it's the first step, right? This is the first hint of, of, of something like that. It's a workaround. Well, and, you know, and it's incremental politics. I tell everyone all the time, you know, everyone knows I'll be leaving the legislature in a year. Some woman will pick up the pieces when I, you know, of my uh, district and, and we'll run with that but I am a big proponent of incremental politics let's take small bites of the apple let's go in let's all try to work together let's try to figure out let's take a small bite if that works let's move and, and so I think these are just small pieces that we're working towards and I think eventually you're going to see uh, probably not going to see locality pay you're probably going to see the agencies are going to be implementing this through their own they'll I think the agencies understand better what they need than even what the legislature 
knows what they need. So I think what we do is we give the freedoms to the agencies. If the you know, uh, school board of the state uh, board of education understands that there's a critical vacancies in Berkeley County, then it's on them to try to figure out the structure of their pay. The same with corrections. This, all those agencies, they understand their agency better than we do. Is there a definition of critical vacancy as to uh, like a percentage of openings or what? I mean, how do I determine it's critical and therefore that pay scale is going to bump as opposed to, you know, so John comes in and gets a job and he's considered critical at that time. Uh, six months later, there's only a few vacancies left. It's not as critical. He's making more than I'm making doing the same job, and yet we got hired a few months apart. I don't think you're going to see that. I, I think that this critical vacancy is going to be what is put on these facilities that are in the areas where there's population growth, where there is problems keeping um, – our corrections officers. I, I don't think you're going to see that monkeyed with anytime soon. I, I'm not. I don't feel that we're going to hire some officers and pay them one, and then if we start to fill our vacancy, this is not a quick fix. This is not going to. This is not going to remedy itself in a year or two. There, this is going to take some time to work itself out, and I don't see that happening. But at some point, the goal obviously it no longer becomes critical mm -hmm. vacancy. It just becomes a regular vacancy. Right. But we're talking years down the line. Years down the road, and by that time, hopefully we are starting to figure this out. And th these pays are not going down. I mean, we're, right. we're, we're not coming in and taking critical vacancy pay away from someone. I mean, these once these pays go in, like I'm very confident that, you know, we're not going to hire CEOs, uh, give them a critical vacancy pay, and then a year later say, well, we're not really critical. That's no, not and, and after a year, they're going to get a raise anyway right. and a retention bonus, and then down the road, they, they, they'll move up to a CO2 or CO3. So on the one-time bonus, as you were talking about before, one comes in October and another one comes in March. In March, um, do people have to stick around for a certain amount of time after they receive these bonuses, or are we setting up folks to walk away in in April? Uh, the main reason we and then come back in March, yeah. right? No, no the ma the main reason that, and I can't get down in the weeds on exactly you know how that works. The main reason we did this was we did not want to give our non uniformed employees a one time bonus while we're giving our uniformed. A, a, a base building raise and they feel a little slighted and they get their bonus and they leave. We wanted to be able to have that dangle that carrot for March to let them know that we care about them, we respect them, and we also are going to be working in January and February in regular session to try to find a, a money stream to be able to give them a, a full-time raise. We, we, we want to try to retain everyone that we can and we want to try to uh, hire as many new hires as we can. And our, by the way, real quick, John, we're going to get into the fire department stuff after the 930 break. Uh, okay. So if you're wondering where that that's coming up soon, go ahead, John. The um, are the non-uniformed workers in, in the prison system, were they as out of step pay wise with the economy as the COs were? Very much, very much. And there was a lot of unity within those two branches of support of each other where the CO said, if you can't take care of the non uniforms then don't don't do anything for us they were very in lockstep with one another which is really a good thing i mean you yeah. shows that there's camaraderie within these it, organizations yeah and it's just a little more difficult because a let's say a um uh, a, a social worker or a clerk or somebody that person is actually working for the state so it's hard to determine okay oh they're working for corrections so there's a lot more work we need to do in order to get them actual raises so that we can carve out if you're a clerk or if you're a social worker within the prison system we can give you a raise um, because if we just gave all clerks that line item would give all clerks across the whole state no matter where you work a, a raise and that's that wasn't the intention so the the committee the house the the, the senate are all working to try and some solve this problem as, as much yeah as so can. if you were a clerk three and you worked at D, and you worked at doh or you were a clerk three and you worked at the capitol when we gave the clerks the rate everyone got that raise so we have to be able to go back in and, and work to be able to delineate that we're going to give those raises to the non-uniformed staff for prisons so and it and and, and i know it's so, that sounds crazy but that's just you know, sometimes you have to unwind government to rewind government John and Mike, the House of Delegates was not in favor of, I think, uh, Senate Finance Chairman Tarr called it a smoothing process in regards to excess funds and the rainy day fund. So the Senate sent something over. You folks did not pass it. Can you tell me what your 
qualms were with it and how it should be voted it, on. I think it died in, in finance. It didn't yeah, I spoke, I spoke a, very vigorously against that bill. I did not like that bill. Uh, we were um, – statutorily, we needed to put about 300 and – I think it was around 300 and – I can't remember the number, the, the overall number, but it was a substa- substantial number to put into the rainy day fund um, to make it whole. Uh, the uh, Senate did a seven-year look back, and they were tr- what they were trying to do, they was going back seven years looking at the revenues to try to make a smoothing action to, to hit those percentages of where we need to be for our rainy day fund. And, and it, the numbers ended up being about the Senate wanted to put $85 million into the rainy day fund, leaving out an additional, I believe it was $144 million. So you can do the math quickly. Uh, we did not like that. I thought statu- we needed to fund the Rainy Day Fund as we statutorily have always funded the Rainy Day Fund. Uh, I think that sometimes when you start uh, looking at those types of uh, uh, deposits and you have your, uh, your bond ratings and the people that oversee the, that lend us money, they don't want to see us constantly changing those statute so you know we had just changed that statute to where you know for many many years 50 percent of the uh, surplus revenues from the year before would automatically go into rainy day so we had changed that statute to where we were going to have where it was going to meet a certain percentage now we were changing that statute again where we were taking a seven-year smoothing i i just didn't like it i thought you know uh we have enjoyed very good record surpluses uh, for the past couple of years, but when a budget crisis hits, a budget crisis hits like a sledgehammer. And uh, I think it's um, uh, being a fiscal conservative. I think that it is our job to make sure that the state is saving the amount of money that we need to save, keeping our rainy day fund, keeping our bond ratings where they need to be, and understanding that uh, at some day uh, the economy is going to slow, uh, global uh, energy prices are going to come down in West Virginia. You know, we we could very well have a budget crisis. Not saying that we will, but we very well could. And when those budget crisis hits, you know, people that have not been in the legislature, when you're sweeping agencies and, you know, you're just you're four hundred million dollars short, you know, five hundred million dollars short, it it gets a little uh, scary. So I believe that we should fund that statutorily the way we're supposed to. So, is it, with nothing being done, does it revert back to what it was previous? It reverts back to the percentage that we wanted it to be at. So in other words, we changed it statutorily where 50% of it, of the surplus revenue automatically went into the rainy day fund. That doesn't happen anymore. Now it's based on a percentage of our general revenue. So we want to be in that 20 to 21% of our general revenue. Now the bonding agencies really want us 16 to 17% is probably okay with them. But, you know, I would rather be two or 3% to the good than I would be just on the line. I mean, I don't run my my household budget, you know, right at the line. I I want to have that buffer. I want to have that that uh, um, area to work in. How is how is revenues defined? Is it the budget you pass at the beginning of the year that's four point eight billion, or is it the six point six billion you end up collecting at the end of the year? It's constantly changing. The bu- the budget revenues can be changed. So then the rainy day would change, and we would the next time we were in, we don't have to immediately change. And deposit money it would be the next time that we came into session we would be able to catch it up so the next time you get together in 2024 you'll look at what figure as the figure that you're paying attention to to fund 21 percent into the rainy day we will look at that number and if we are below the surplus number percentage where we need to be then we will take money from surplus revenue 23 and we will deposit that into the rainy day to bring that to where it needs to be because we'll still be working on surplus there'll be surplus revenues 23 We'll start, we'll start to be having a good look at surplus revenue 24, and we'll be working on 25 budgets. So you're really juggling three budgets sometimes. Um, like last year when we were in session, we looked at surplus 2022, and we drew down money from that for a few things that the governor wanted. And in regards to the balance of the rainy day fund, at one point, I think there's two different funds that equal the balance, which at one point was a billion dollars. And then when the stock market dropped, those funds drop below a billion dollars, as I understand it. I, I assume the funds are invested in very conservative things. I had assumed cash or cash equivalents, but apparently there is a little bit of risk involved in those funds. So there's uh, excess revenue fund A and excess revenue fund B. Uh, one is more of a short-term type um, 
uh, investment, and I'm not going to get too far down in the weeds, and that's a question for Dave Hardy, the Revenue Secretary. But uh, there's an uh, a A and a B. One is more of a short term. One is more of a long term, uh, and and how that is broken out: liquidity versus bonds versus you know stocks, portfolios, and such. I I don't know that we actually have a whole division of the state that is our investment bureau that does all the investing for the state. Hey, we're going to talk about the fire department work that you folks did and uh, get into those details details as well to paid versus unpaid and all that good stuff the vice chair of finance in the house of delegates john hardy and the mogul delegate mike cornby let's talk about fire departments volunteer fire departments distribution of funds and how this ultimately will all work out in the end john why don't you go first yeah so uh you know i i uh, was pretty happy with the way the legislation came out uh you know when we first started t- kicking this around and taking this back it was the same old uh big pile of steaming you know what that we had dealt with in the first and uh, yeah, started the, as, a, as, a, as a tax increase yeah it was there. a tax increase and that's how we'd worked it in session and no one liked it we couldn't pass it it came back to us the exact same way uh i had worked two weeks prior to the session uh working the governor's office working uh the speaker's office and working with the senate president trying to figure out a better way to do this and i'm not saying this was my idea the governor's office put this plan together it came to us as not a tax increase it came to us as one-time money from uh, surplus revenues 2023 2023 surplus money as a one-time spend um which I thought that was a good way that the governor came up with it. It was one-time funding. It didn't raise anyone's taxes, and it took care. It had the metrics involved where it was going to be fairly distributed, and it was a pretty good plan. Uh, The Senate added an amendment at the very last minute that actually changed it from surplus revenue 2023 and changed it to excess revenue 24. So it's going to kick the can down the road a little bit. The, The money won't be instantaneous as it would have been uh, in the governor's version, it's probably going to take another maybe four to six months for that money to trickle in to be able to give this to the fire departments. But this is a not a one-time funding. It's base building of $12 million. It's a permanent fix. It's a permanent yeah. fix. And it was broken down into three separate funds. So there are $6 million that will be distributed evenly across the state to every fire hall. So every fire hall will receive the same amount of money across the state. There's an additional $3 million that is out out there that is the first modifier if your county has a fire fee or a fire levy or anything i think that, there's 28 or 38 i think there's 38, 38 counties that has a dedicated fee to fire service that's the first modifier that breaks up that three thousand dollars or three, three million three million dollars the third modifier that was put in was based on the growth counties and there was eight growth counties well as always happened someone had heartburn with the term growth counties they didn't want to see that three million dollars broken up between eight counties so we uh, there was an amendment that was proposed uh, in house finance that I begrudgingly <laughs> supported uh, and it broke it up for population so basically we'll take that last three million dollars take it 1.8 billion or 1.8 million people in the state of West Virginia and divide that by three three million so basically it ends up being somewhere as maybe like a dollar seventy-five. I, I don't know the math, but a dollar fifty, a dollar yeah. seventy-five per person per county. So Berkeley County is still going to have a windfall because and, of our population. And I think uh, what they did that I really liked was they, that those two extra pools of three million, they give the county council the ability to either spend it on EMS fire, but also the ability to spend it on firefighters so um, that initial six million and the, the money they get from us paying our, our uh, insurance on our houses they can only spend that on training or uh, equipment but this little extra pool gives freedom to the county council or, or county commission should I say to spend it how they wish which was, I thought was fantastic and um, when it came back from the Senate I thought they'd really done it fixed the bill if you will yeah, there was a few people that was a little perturbed that 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 amendment happened very late, you know, seven o'clock on yeah. a, the last night of the special session. But we we was able to work through it, and um, there was a, you know some floor speeches on that, and and uh, I I thought that it was a pretty decent fix because it's it's you know that the the point five five that you've always paid on your firing collateral stayed the same. That goes to all of the fire halls. The new six million 
goes to all of the fire halls. So I don't really think that it's fairly distributed, but you take what you can get. The next six million broken down into three funds of three million each. And, and when Berkeley we, when we say it, it's unfair, it, it it basically Berkeley County by having substations did themselves a disservice because we still only have seven fire halls. Um, well, you go down into Boone County and Josh Holstein, they got twenty one fire halls. They might have a tenth of the population, but every fire sub thing is called a fire hall. So, I mean, I would talk to the county. I would suggest to county council that we open more fire halls. Yeah, Are just, there guidelines on to what this money is spent for? You said yes. So, so the first point five five that comes from our fire and um, casualty can only be spent on equipment and training. The second uh, six million that we implemented in can only be used for training and equipment uh and the second six or the third actually the, the six million that's divvied up between that has the modifiers that can be used for retention that can be used for equipment that can be used for payments to pay for paid firefighters so realistically it's about you know six million dollars that's on the whole that's available to berkeley county berkeley county is going to receive about if if my math is correct about 1.3 million dollars that we will be able to use towards paid and in talking with uh, the, the fire chief, I mean, and to the council, I mean, it would probably, if we fully staffed for Berkeley County, you're looking at about 2.2. .2. So it's a great start. Yeah. It really is a it's good about, start. about $900,000 per fire hall for a 24 yeah. hour. So that is continual money then that will be it coming in? It is permanent, in. yes. Okay. But, well, it's permanent as of now. I mean, okay. the, legis the legislature could change it. The legislature but. can change anything. But uh, the first thing I would do if I was a county commissioner, is when I received that money, I would bond that money out. I would I would tie that money up where it was bonded out. I had borrowed against it. I would had equipment. I would do something to tie that money up. So when the uh, if the if the legislature ever says, hey, we got to come take that money out, you can say, hey, that's a dedicated revenue stream for A, B, and C. If you take that, I mean, that's 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 the game that's played in government. Whenever there's money available, the first thing you do is try to bond it or tie it to something. That way, when they come to take it, you say, hey, well, that's fine. Our future sure. councilman here. <laughs> <laughs> Great Commissioner now. Commissioner. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm only used to councilmen, so it's going to take me forever to get back. I still have an election to win, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, the terminology will be commissioner regardless. Though. So with what you were able to do in the special session, uh, how much more still needs to be done when you all get together? in January of next year in, in the next session when you're looking at firefighting and handling those things across the state. By the way, Eric Halsorder just texted me and said, 231 million, it's all subject to legislative appropriations. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, the ex-finance chairman. I'm telling you, that guy knows more about budget than anybody I've ever, that guy, he knows it. And HVAC, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, 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 so. so again, uh, it, it, do you feel, I obviously feel good about this being a start, but what may become or, or where do you go from yeah, here in the I, I next like session? This, I feel like this is a great start. I don't know where we go from here. I mean, I, I've had the conversations with Senator Barrett. You know, we think that, you know, eventually everyone's going to paid fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's five years from now or 25 yeah. years from now, eventually every county is going to go to paid fire staff because... The volunteers are, ju are just... They're going away. They're yeah. going away. Yeah. And, yes. and I think everybody realizes that, and we need to get the county councils and the counties and the fire department, we need to start having those conversations well, now for 10 years. Yeah. And I think that some of this money, and I, I, you know, and listen, volunteer firefighters are very, very proud of their firehouses. Mm -hmm. Most of that equipment that's in those firehouses, they've paid for. They've raised the money. They've bought it. They've went out and got the federal grants. They've talked to their uh, – to their uh, senators and to their congressmen, and they have worked to raise money, you know, sold a lot of hot dogs and pepperoni rolls and such to raise that. They're very proud of those. And those fire halls need to be funded uh, to make sure that the, some of that money goes directly to the fire halls. But I also think there needs to be a portion of that money that goes to the county commissions or even if even not even the county commission to the to the local county fire board because you're definitely going to have fire halls that are going to be busier than other ones. If you have 15 fire halls in a county, there's going to be three or four fire halls that are going to be much more busy, or more busy than some of the more rural ones due to population, due to accidents, due to just more things happening. So I think that the local fire board, 
would be a good place to start. The county commission would be a place to start to say, listen, X amount of dollars is going directly to the volunteer firefighters. They know how to run their house, pay their bills, take care of their equipment. But X amount of dollars is going to go to where we can divvy that out to the fire stations who need it. I don't think that's as big of a problem in Berkeley County because we have – you know, five or six yeah. fire halls, and I don't know how many of those. We have the municipal one that's paid in the city of Martinsburg. I think where that falls and becomes more important is a county like Mingo County that has 17 fire halls. There is obviously two or three or four of those fire halls that are that are handling the abund the most calls out of that county. You mentioned Martinsburg being municipal. Are, are there a lot of other municipal fire departments across the state, yeah. and does this impact them as think, well? I and mean, we've talked a lot of county, if you will, but they. I, th fit I think a lot that. of the cities across the state have a, a, a municipal paid fire uh, okay. fees, uh, paid fire force. I, yeah. I think Martinsburg is not an exception. And I will that. tell you, I do not know exactly how the breakdown is for the municipal paid fire. So I, I think mm -hmm. that this money is probably going to the volunteer departments and then to the counties. I don't think this money is going to the municipalities. And I could be wrong. I, I, I didn't delve too deep into that part of it. It, it was really a whirlwind two days. Mm -hmm. We passed, we worked on 43 pieces of legislation and I worked in finance committee on Monday for 10 and a half hours. We worked legislation for 10 and a half hours. And, um, th and this was super extraordinary. Like this is not normal no. uh, to, to, to show up and have 40 something bills. Of course, like, John's been there, Vern's been there 20 something years. This is like the first time ever that something like this has happened. Yeah, so. we had this much legislation on a special yeah. session. A special session is typically for, for being able to just move money around, spending authority, excess revenues, maybe this agency, and then maybe if there's something that's an emergency. We dealt with a lot of things that were not emergencies. There was way too much stuff on the call. And, the call well, was very let me ask you, if we could get somebody in trouble here, maybe, I don't know. But it seemed like the Senate had more time and was prepared for what they're about to discuss. There's a glossy publication right there. And the House, I heard stories of people running in, hurrying up, getting there. Uh, they just found the, out. I was texting you guys about coming yeah. on, and you didn't even know what time you were gaveling in the next morning. I, what was for, going on? For a regular House member, I'm a new guy, so I, I'm not privy to leadership or finance or anything like that. Um, I literally talked to Crush. I was like, well, you know, the, the governor has, has to give us three days' notice. Apparently, that's not, not a thing. He doesn't have to give us that. So I left Sunday. I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave about 9. I was pulling in for lunch um, about halfway, and we get the text. It was like 1.30, and I'm 150 miles away from Charleston still. Hey, we're, uh, we're caucusing at 4 or, or 3, 3 o'clock, I think, um, and we're going into session at 4. So had to skip lunch. Get I literally had 15 minutes to change, put a suit on, get down to the Capitol. There were people showing up, like, all through the caucus. Like, people were <laughs> like, <laughs> coming out of the weeds all over the place. Bill Ridenauer didn't get the message till 3, so he didn't get there till a couple hours into the first session. So Why the lack of communication? I, I can't answer that. I will tell you that it was quite chaotic, and the, I will tell you the speaker was not very happy about it. There was a lot of stuff that went on the call. We didn't. The call didn't even come out till four thirty. I'm not putting it on the governor or the senate. It's, it just was a very chaotic uh, special session with a lot of stuff pushed into the end of the session. Uh, I don't know how prepared the senate was. I know that the house we were caught off guard, and then there was a little bit of uh, uh, it was a little bit of frantic. I think that we did a really good job to recover. I will tell you that the House uh, did its due diligence, and we took up the legislation, but we also sent all of our legislation to committee. Uh, it has always been the House's posture to send stuff to, to committee, and if we have to be in a committee room for 5 hours, 10 hours, or 15 hours, and I've been in a committee room for 15 hours, 12 hours is probably the longest one I've ever done. We make sure that we vet everything through our committee process. I will tell you that the Senate does not always do that, and I'm not here to criticize the Senate. The Senate runs the Senate the way that they want to run the Senate. The House runs the way that they, we want to run the House. But I will tell you, we started out a bit chaotic. Uh, we was able to gather ourselves. We were able to send everything to committee. And I am very proud of the Finance Committee. The House Finance Committee is a very strong, opinionated committee that works very hard, uh, does not mind hurting each other's feelings, uh, speaking our minds, but at the end of the day, we're all friends, we're all colleagues, and we did a very good job of vetting this uh, information. Mike, did you feel like you were rushed in voting for anything? Uh, well, it was kind of hurry up and wait from, from 
my standpoint because we, we I was obviously sitting listening to finance and they, that was not a short meeting and there was not one bill that they talked about that everybody went, yeah, let's, let's just do it. It was contentious. Um, everybody's got great ideas and I, I'm really proud to that, that our, my colleagues in the house, I, when something comes out of finance, I can be sure it's been vetted. Um, so I don't have to sit there and, and, and critique them after the fact. There was plenty of floor discussion. Um, I felt, I felt when we were going down, we would be talking about volunteer fire departments and um, corrections. Um, when the there, there was a lot of other stuff in there, um, I, I'm very proud to sit on education. But there were, there were two school funding um, things: one for Marshall and one for Pierpont. Um, and I, I, to me, nobody had come to us in education and talked about that. And I, I know my chair had voiced his concerns in in finance that hey, this is the first time we've heard about these fundings for these schools uh, or higher education. We just felt left out of the process. Um, and whether that was the governor, or the senate, the how. I, the leadership I don't know but it's when you sit on a committee you you want to do the work you, know, uh, you want to do the work and finance takes their job very seriously so do we in education if, economic development um, but during the session um, I still managed to make all of my um, committee meetings and in the interims because we had interims at the same time so there was lots of good presentations lots of good ideas um, lots of uh, Rule making. Um, so it, it, I had a great time. Um, it was the hurry up and wait. There was a lot of hurry up and wait. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for coming in. Yes. Appreciate the information. My pleasure. And the detail. And thanks, John, for all you did. Thank you, Mike.